computer really quick? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I So that wait. So, oops. <laughs> Let me. Uh, yeah, Brent. Just to show you how to do that really quick. Okay. So over here is this little guy right there. Screen. Screen, screen share. share. And then whatever select inside screen share is what you're going to be sharing. So yeah, once you're plugged so. in, oh, okay. the second screen you can do just the second screen. Well, I need yeah, yeah I'll, I'll need to set that up because yeah. originally I was just going to screen share my my screen, but right. maybe, maybe I shouldn't make changes this late in the game. But yeah. <laughs> and we're going to use yours as the microphone because you don't have to do I have no sound, just to let you know. You don't need sound. Okay. Can just let. Me. Yeah, I can talk. Um, okay. The mic works. The speakers do not. Oops. I accidentally hit the mouse. And we are broadcasting the sound from there right now, so don't say anything stupid yet. Can you mount that on the tripod? Yeah, I just decided not to. Is that your tripod? Or yeah, that's my tripod. Oh, I need to. I decided to use this camera instead. It's kind of a low res camera, at least it looks here like that here. Whoa. I'm, I'm getting dizzy really looking at that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's an easy camera. Oh, page object, that's what I want. That's kind of important. All right. And what? What is that? I need to. What? Oh, that's what we're having for food. Yep. Okay. I'm not going to be able to eat though. So you want? Well, I got to. I don't want to eat while I'm presenting. Yeah. <laughs> it is tough. Yeah, I figured that that one blank was... Are you primarily going to be sitting there, though? Yeah. Will you stand up at all? Uh, I had thought about it. Why? I'm just wondering. You must be not standing up in the air, though. So you put the, no, you're taller than me, though, I think. Yeah, I'm six yeah. foot. So if I, yeah. There you go. I might stand up and do this sort of thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Can we move this help from behind you? Yeah, you, that's on wheels. That's a weird sound, but, yeah, it's just. There we go. That's if you undo the wheel lock, too. Ah. <laughs> it it wasn't that hard to move. <laughs> it's not a very good wheel lock. All right. Save this and print it again. Killing trees. Yeah, I'm killing trees. All right, I'll be right back. All right. Shouldn't need that. Don't need that. I do need to. This projector's not on yet. I need to organize these. Thank you. 
room is just always in a different setup. Every yeah. Time. I just want this right here. Um, you wanted to give out a gift card during the thing for participation. Can we repurpose at least one of the gift cards for audience participation? Yeah, we can do that. Just do one raffle. And then well, I can. I actually have two places I can give out gift cards if they want me to do them that way. But it's up to you. Yeah, that's fine. Two, 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 two questions. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We can just do it purely. Uh, Let me make sure I actually. So, yeah, you we'll probably want to just mention that. Why? Then the people who participate are rewarded, right? So. Yeah. 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 Right. We make. Uh, ooh, question. Do you want to ask for participation and then give them the gift cards at the end, or do you want to give them? Because if you say right after that. You know, maybe after the second question, you say, all right, you and who are this for time. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, everyone's going to be answering that. Yeah. yeah, just take note of um, okay. the answers. What? Okay, so uh, you only have two questions? or No, I mean, uh, I, it's... Hang on. So what's Watch. the bad thing? Okay. Yeah, I guess. Giving the first gift card right away. Yeah, and then get people more excited about the thing. Yeah, that's fine. A lot of speakers use that as a tool. Yeah. All right, sir. You want to give those two ten dollar gift cards? Gordon Beers, the three legged man. So do we have all? Who are our spots for the? the I. The, who should pass? I'd actually prefer. Uh, I'd actually prefer that one of you guys hang out because I need to be up here. So you tell me what to give them away, and I'll hand them out. Yeah, I'm going to say by a show of hands. We can. We can. Well, well, we could also just say you want to give part of one of the gift cards at the end, then we give it out. Okay, that's probably the best way. Because then we're not like, which one do you want during your presentation? I'll just say something. Like, we have something for you after yeah. this branch. I'm perfect. So those two are portal. Okay, what do we get? I'll update you. Yeah, 
think I left off at home, so you gotta put in Dynex, Hawkins, and Jason. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Can't match that level later. <laughs> Come here. Is there a sign in that? Yeah, it lied to you. What? I am actually going to need to get up and come over here. That's fine. I'm, I need to be located, so okay. I'm going to let you explore. All right. <laughs> In fact, I need to write some stuff up here. Can I erase this or? Uh, the training room stuff is, uh, I don't know. We, I feel like we should just write it somewhere else to do that. Right up here. Yeah. So it's at the school all the way over there. All the way over here? Yeah. Oh, uh, maybe. I was going to write the Wi-Fi in here. Is that? Oh, uh, well, no, I can, you know, I think this will be enough space. And it, um, are you okay with me writing here? Yeah. All
So this is pretty much the yeah. depth of the still. Uh, you mean the new incinerator? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Are you going to be able to tell who's connected online? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if we opened it up the actual hangout. I think we just opened up uh, the YouTube link so people can watch it. I don't know if there's a participation. We need to do Yeah, so we just went to the central, which is another one that we can have. Which is the one we can have by that, so. Yeah, actually, uh, one thing that I feel like we're leaving out of that timeline and it brought it up was. Why can I not get this? Um, up. The Chrome, like the overall look and feel, because I've seen all of those components they felt that, I mean, outline and detail, this piece, that piece, this page, that page, but the overall header footer and the start of the project, and the application is just looking at that. And that was a whole huge chunk of time. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. Like, I feel like there's another there's another allocated portion. What? There's no no allocated portion. Yeah, that's not going to work. When you get a chance, can you also pass the slide deck or code beer whenever they? Uh, yeah, one second. Sure. I I'm trying to get this worked out. Yeah, yeah. Forget the project. Um. Oh, until like. Oh, it says it should. These are that's one and two. What? That's stupid. Okay. Oh. Okay. All right. What is? What's the second monitor here? Um, oh no, I would I would have expected it's a projector. What's the thing that you want? Okay, Cat six zero six six. This is like we just said the day before. This is a test Yeah, I would say because I'm going to put that together. Yeah. Because you're running the next. Damn it. Yeah, yeah. So that could be enough time. I cannot get it to display on. So just, just do the second Duplicate. What the hell? I did see it.
I have connected to this in the past, and I've not had this problem. Why? Why is this happening to me? God. Hey Wes, are you? Uh, Can I get some? What's that? Are you an expert here on that? I'm an expert. No. Because I don't know. Well, uh, it's just not outputting. I wonder if it's. Oh, and this guy? Yeah. You're on HDMI? It is. Yeah, yeah that's the right yeah, one. It is HDMI. All right, hold on a second. It was outputting earlier, you just, but it was only when you were extended, right? I Yeah, and I don't want it extended. Yeah. Can we switch from HDMI to. Yeah, you can do that. To uh, uh, I, VHA, VGA? Well, I need the resolution, though, on, on this. Yeah, is that, so I. It, it, it might no, it doesn't. It doesn't. I use VGA on my TV at home on that laptop, and I get. Why am I getting this second monitor here? This Cat 6066. What is that? I guess that's the projector. All right, so. Is that displaying on there? Yeah. No, it's extending. All right, so I'm going to have to code this. I, I I can't see anything here. So you, uh, you're just trying to mirror that too? Yeah. Go to advanced settings. And the F8 doesn't. But the F8 is what got me here. Yeah, there is the option for duplicate. Stand, but it doesn't do anything. So duplicate doesn't. Yeah, yeah, it might be just be the. Oh, it could be the the resolution you need to change because it may be a different resolution for out. Yeah, it's a lot lower. I mean, that's that's the same machine I had. That's a. I think it's. What's that? Like ten twenty four or something crazy low mm -hmm. for the projector though. Is it basically, that might be it. Yeah, directly connecting to that, so it's one of the projector supports. Well, no, he's trying to be in 1080. Yeah. 1080p. Like, no, I'm at 1024. I no, can go. To, trying to be I can go to 1024, but I need. It didn't help. Yeah, that doesn't. It doesn't do anything. And I've got these two monitors here that are. We definitely. Yeah, it's going to try to it Can we try VGA? Yeah. Okay. It's less than ideal, though. I know this isn't going to do. I, I can. See, there you go. You're attending. That's and it is duplicated. That's colors. Yes, yeah, but that's it. Just means it needs to go in more. And we can I've, track it down. No, I've tried. It's plugged in very solidly here. So. Now something you're touching is is changing colors. Uh, the analog is. Are you it, or is that you? Um, is I'm just doing. Uh, we could. Oh, are you in the VGA? Yeah. Yeah, the cable. I just put that cable in. That's a brand new cable that was right there. This is a brand new that I just put it for oh. VGA, right? Yeah. Brand new VGA cable. Well, I don't think it, I think it's this. That's right, because I don't have cucumber installed. All right, so I'll just have to wait and not sure. I don't think it's a common adjustment. No, I mean, it's just a I've used, see, the thing is, is, I've used the HDMI port on this before. Well, maybe now try switching it after it's been in. All right, let me try switching it. 
seems like the best option so far is you have to go to why is that down in there? I can't get it. I still have desktop here, and my mouse is off somewhere. I, I can't get the window to come up, though. On Oh, there we go. Wait, no. That's not right. Uh, all right, if I can't fix it. That's kind of tough, but I can do it. Yeah, yeah, I'm, as long as we got time left, I'm willing to try. This says extend. I want to duplicate it. Yeah. And there it breaks away. Signal input. Try. I wonder if you. PC screen only. Here, hold on a second. Let me see something here. I've got this second monitor. Um, yeah. Let's see, it won't let me duplicate it here in this in these settings. Can you hit detect now. Another display not detected. No display te detected. No. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> um, identify. This is one. Oh. My. Yeah, I thought I thought you had it. <laughs> I think it's a driver issue. Damn, Windows 8. No. That in mind. We have another uh, DJ All right, well, if you want to grab, uh, get, go ahead and try it. I'm going to set up for this until we have something else. So you're a good golfer, right? So you said the VGA. Uh, was the I'm a decent was golfer, right? but I'm not going. Uh, I told, yeah, I know he's got me signed up, but I told, I told Scott. Um, I never really, I never tried that story like this. I Well, I won't need my glasses, I don't think. I'll leave them here just in case. Cover and cheese. What happened to my display? Oh, okay. You make that a little bit brighter. So we still hard to tell. I did want this. See, I'm putting a slide deck on the hangout. Okay. I don't have it. Yes. Well, I mean, your monitor. Are you yeah. Well, I'll have to. You have to go into Hangouts. I thought already. No, I just you have to. Uh, share. 
Um, share. All right. There it is. Yeah, yeah. What's where's that? At? Um, okay, so I need to minimize this. That's going to distract me. All right. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. You want what? I can request access. Here's the mouse if you need it. Everyone, thanks again for coming to the next edition of uh, Code and Beer. Uh, we've got some 
I think everyone's been familiar. We've got one new face that hasn't been the code and mirror we had before, so welcome. So, is it, uh, I can't remember your first name. Nate. Nate, okay. Nate, everyone, everyone, Nate. <laughs> so, we've got an exciting uh, lineup. Phil is going to talk about some ATDD, specifically uh, cucumber and some Ruby setup. Uh, we're going through that. It's going to be a full presentation, so it's just him tonight. So, get some extra Chinese food and beer, and we'll be good to go. Uh, next month is going to be interesting. It's the first time we've ever done this. I'm going to say it wrong. I've been saying it wrong every time. But it's the chaka cha. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. All right, chaka cha. We've been called a pecha kucha forever. But, uh, is that what they said? Pecha kucha? Chaka cha. All right. So I think we've talked about it before, but if you guys haven't heard, um, it's 20 slides that are 20 seconds each. And so those are on a timer. You don't have time. It's just kind of showcasing uh, what something cool you've been working on real short and sweet. We've already got our 10 spots filled up, so hopefully we've got a full range of data, UI, uh, Microsoft, and got some Java in there, I believe. So should be some fun stuff. Uh, for any of you that are on that list, they're presenting, I think Joel and Feige are the only ones that are here. Nick Homer is just stealing food and water. Aaron. Yes. Aaron, I didn't recognize you from your hairband photos. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we'll try to submit those slides two days in advance so we have time to put those together so we have one slide deck with all the timing and everything. Uh, keep in mind, if you want to do everything in PowerPoint, and try to use common fonts like Arial. If you want to use any, you know, specific font, try doing an image as your slides. So you can just embed anything you want. So won't be not really an interactive presentation, kind of more of a showcase. Which I can show. showcase. But uh, after that, uh, yeah, John's up. Where's John? Is he still outside eating food? I don't know. I just he, was last, he was just in the other room eating over there. But anyway, he's presenting in November a uh, client side framework. Uh, I don't know any more details about that. We can go into is this a uh, dry run for anything? Or? No, it's, it's a comparison between different frameworks while you do that. Well, all right. Good to know. After that, uh, remember, yeah, there's no December meeting. We've already got a Jan at least a January meeting lined up. So, and if you want to present anything, we've got some spots at the start of next year, so start thinking about what topics you want to present. And uh, without, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Phil. So, thanks. All right. Um, where am I? Oh. All right. Well, before the class started, or the talk started and everything, I, I downloaded 193P545 uh, of Ruby from the Ruby installer and installed it. I uninstalled Ruby here and then did that. So I'm starting from where you would be starting if you're uh, joining along here. Um, the, uh, this talk is not about uh, why you should do ATVD. There are a lot of talks out there to that effect. Um, and through a discussion with some people, uh, it was decided that I would give a talk on how you do it, how, you know, how you're going to set it up, how you're going to make use of it, what gems I would recommend, all that kind of good stuff, um, and how it might be useful to you in a day-to-day -day life. So uh, I, I would mention that in the past, uh, installs were a little painful on this, but that has gotten a lot easier. If you go through this installer here, it's all point and click. Uh, just select all three checkboxes and pretty much accept everything, and, you, and you'll have it installed. Um, to verify that you have um, Ruby installed, you would just basically go to command prompt, type Ruby V. Here we can see that we have Ruby 193P545 installed. And if I do a gem list dash dash local, that will show me all the gems I have, which is a grand total of six right now. So to get started with scripting, uh, we're going to install a gem 
here. And to do that, I'm going to install Gem Water Web Driver. I don't have a local display here, so I'm kind of coding up here as I go. So the uh, Ruby Gem Manager is basically a package manager that comes along with Ruby. It's, it comes down with this install package as well. Um, it's been around since Ruby's been around, and it handles not just the gem that you want to install, but any dependencies that you might want along with that. Um, it's very useful um, and pretty easy to use, although everything is at a command line. OK. And that should be done here in just a second. And so while that's installing, uh, to interact with any type of web interface, we need some type of driver. And that's what we're installing here, that water web driver. That automate or instruments the web interface, whether that be in Firefox, Chrome, IE, or any other browser that you can think of. Um, that's its sole purpose. Uh, that's what this jump does. And here in a second, if you uh, let me come up here. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, if you want the files for this talk, it's out here on my uh, GitHub repo. That's um, did we pass out yeah. the sheets? The second paper behind the uh, all the links are, are on there. there. Yeah, Water Web Driver is built on top of the Selenium Web Driver, so it's it has all the functionality of the Selenium Web Driver and a few extra things when it comes to the page out there. Um, so, I'm missing a page. Okay. Um, all right, so let's just go over the scripting here. Um, so in the files here, if you download these from um, GitHub, uh, <coughs> I had all these open, so hold on, hold on a second. Um, to make use of this script, we can uh, run it in the IRB console here. We could just basically require a uh, water web driver. Um, define a browser variable and set that equal to water browser.new. And we're going to tell it would pass it the symbol Firefox to say that we want to use Firefox in this case. And then from there, we just would browse to it using the browser. Hopefully, I'm not fat fingering anything while I go. And back here, you can see that it browsed to the Apple website. Um, you can do all of this in IRB, which is the interactive Ruby console. It's kind of a small space that you can use to hammer out things that you're working on in Ruby. But once you have a full script put together, which I have in um, this file back here, this is, I called it first.rb. Um, here we have the same script that I just typed in. We're going to sleep for 15 seconds and then just close the browser. It's, Pretty much the same thing. Um, and you can run that from a command line uh, just like so. And that will run, run that in about 15 seconds. It'll shut it down. But that in and of itself is a little boring, just browsing to a single website. Um, what we could do is 
something a little more interesting. Whereas where we browse to a website and actually have it navigate down through the, the website and do something um, that we, you know, something interesting and test some kind of functionality. Now on a public website like this, um, I don't have my speakers on just so, so you know, so you'll get to watch it, but we're not going to hear anything. Um, <laughs> um, if you're instrumenting a public website, it's going to be more problematic than when you have uh, access. Oh, okay. It's playing through the projector there. <laughs> um, but it, and we'll see here in a second why that's going to be a little more problematic. Um, but it, what's that? Uh, I can, but I might break this the script. Then uh, there is no more of this particular script. But if I had more that I wanted to do after this um, uh, trailer played, if I wanted it to do other things, and I'm not in the location, uh, it depends. Is the answer there? Uh, yeah. Yeah, like I, yeah. So I can I can tell it I want this full screen right now, and it'll still shut down the browser here in about a hundred seconds. You're probably asking more about front script, though. Oh yes. You, anything. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Anything that you can do with your mouse and and a keyboard, you can do on this website. But let me show you here in a second why. So there it closed down the browser. So if I come out to IMDB, <coughs> um, I'm not going to type in the whole thing, but out of the Battle, uh, battle of Five arm, Armies, um, well, that's not exactly. So we got to this list, and then we browse down. Now, if I bring up the code associated with that, um, here you're seeing that we're requiring the water web driver. We then instantiate this. This is how Ruby does a namespace right here, this water. So there's namespace, then the class itself, browser.new, we're instantiating that class and passing it the per parameter of Firefox, which is a symbol. Ruby. Hmm. Um, from there, we tell it to browse the main website of IMDb, and then things get a little messy. Um, fortunately, the text field that we type in the Hobbit, the Battle of Five Armies, has an ID associated with it, and so does the button to, to actually kick, kick off the search. So those are fairly easy to find because they're guaranteed to be unique. But once we get down here to um, this screen right here, this is a table. And none of the items in that table have any kind of guaranteed unique value. That the table itself is unique to that page, so that's what we're end up, what we end up grabbing at first. We're grabbing the table that has this class find list. Now, uh, using a selector of cla class is a little bit dangerous because multiple elements on a HTML page can have the same class. But in this case, only there is only one element. From there, I'm telling it to take the first table row and then the second cell. And I know in that cell there's an anchor element. And I'm getting that, and I'm telling it to click it. From there, you go into that clicks that. And then we're in the page itself. What we want to come down to is this button right here. And it's kind of the same situation where it's an anchor tag buried down deep in a, in a table. And here I did, did it a slightly different way to show you that you, can, you could select it by class. Uh, and I gave it this big, long uh, series of, it's actually a couple of classes there. And I can only do that because there's only one element on that page that has all of those classes. Um, otherwise, we get back an array of anchor tags. And I would have to choose which anchor tag I wanted to click on. 
So it can get a little messy when you're working in on a project. IDs are are your friends. You know, you want to assign IDs whenever possible because you'll be able to find find those in your uh, cube tests. But for scripting like this, um, you can still get to the elements that you want, that uh, don't have IDs and things of that nature. Now, where would this be useful? I don't know. Uh, let's say you had a timesheet or a status report or a TPS report that you had to fill out every week. You might create a script that went to that location and, and kicked off the initial part of that process. Or you might create a collection of trailers that you could look at. Anything that you want. It'll get you practice with the router web driver and um, maybe make your life a little easier in the process. Um, now, I want to stress here, at this point, we are here. We've installed Ruby, we've pulled down the water web driver jam, and we're often scripting. We can script all kinds of things at this point. You don't need anything beyond this to do what we're doing here. But this is not just about Ruby scripting. This is about Cucumber as well. So let's kick that off. Also on the page that I passed out, there is a link to the Water Web Driver API um, in case you want to learn more about how to manipulate that. Can I ask a quick question about the selectors? Sure. Do you know where they list out all the possibilities and options for them? Uh, it's not. Well, so you're familiar with that HTML tags and, and these, uh, I mean, yeah. it depends on what element you're interacting with. Different HTML elements have different things. Um, but this is basically a, a symbol if you, OK, so to answer your question. Do you know if it's only on attributes or if pseudo selectors exist too? Well, I, I don't know that, but let's let's find out. Let's say, so here's the API for the water web browser, or water web driver. Um, and let's let's go down to a text box here. So text field is what I think I used there. Uh, these are the various methods that you can operate on if I I'm, I'm working with limited space here, so uh, in this case I did, uh, let's go to the table actually, because I, I did something. So we would pull up the table, and you can see back here I accessed it by class. So down here, um, There's class name. I can. Um, where does it list the selectors? I'm trying to remember. Uh, I, I'm wondering if maybe this isn't a question about the sliver, but it's more on the Ruby side, and I think it's just the way that you're using your selector right there in that example. Uh, yeah, actually, it's not it's, part of it. Uh, yeah, it's just. What, what, what are you yeah, asking? That's just, that's just traditional, like that's a Ruby selector, not anything with the slide. Yeah, yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. it is actually Ruby, and that's what I'm looking in the wrong yeah. place. All right, so. Uh, sorry, I got a little off track there. No, yeah, that was my fault. Uh, um, what was I talking about? <laughs> All right, so we need to install Cucumber. So by a show of hands, um, so we talked about the Ruby gems and all of that. And anybody by a show of hands tell me what I would need to do at this point if I want to install Cucumber on here. Take a wild guess out. Gem install. Whatever. <laughs> Cubes. Uh, <laughs> that was, no hands. Uh, <laughs> nobody put up a hand. Um, I think. <laughs> uh, 
I'll let somebody else make the call on that one. But yes, that, it's gem install cucumber. Oh, not Jay cucumber. Cucumber. Uh, yep, yeah, that means he's a winner. So this will pull it down. It, uh, it, it'll only take a second. It went a little faster uh, when I went through trials on this, but yeah, that may slow things down a little bit. <laughs> I I had that problem at first when we first got here. I I disconnected and then I was all right. So in this. Uh, should have this open here. Yeah, th um, that's you'll you'll see people use that frequently. Um, it yes, it's short for cucumber. But the the important thing here is that you don't actually need a uh, a directory called cucumber. Um, there is um, a convention here. Um, at play, but it doesn't start with cucumber. It starts with a directory, whatever you want to call it. You can call it foo if you want. And then within that directory, you're going to have a features folder. Um, you're going to have steps folder and a support folder. Uh, your features will be here. Your step definitions will be here. Now let's open this up and start explain what I mean by that. If, if you haven't done cucumber before, this is a Gherkin syntax. It's a way of laying out a, um, a, a requirement, if you will, um, given that it's the three A's of testing. My arrangement, given that I have all of these things arranged, when I have an action, then I can assert that certain things are true or false or whatever. So arrange, act, assert, it's the uh, same method. But then these statements right here, like given I open the browser, so we saw how we opened a browser in just scripting. If I come back over here and I go into my steps, I will find a step that says, I open, a open the browser. And this is just a regex match on this feature definition. Mm -hmm. so, um, so if I come down here and I run the cu cucumber, uh, Wait, wait a minute. Oh, I think I'm... One second. Yeah, this... So, cucumber. What are we missing here? One second. Oh, RSpec. Okay, so I never loaded RSpec. So. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> All right, now, I would, the reason I didn't do this is I actually wanted to do this during uh, the next part. I'll, I'll remove it because I wanted to show fun more in this part, but I didn't go, and that was a change I made last night. And I didn't go back and test this part of the talk as related to that. So uh, we also need our spec here because we're using our spec expectations. That all that that does for you is um, allows you to to say things like um, ex uh, these expectations right here, where I expect the source to include this name. Um, And it, it gives it a more human readable uh, version of the assertions. If any, if anyone's ever used a should assertion library of any kind, that's effectively what our spec is. Um, so now, if I come back over here, 
keep my fingers crossed and type correctly, we should get this running. Uh, except I forgot one thing. Oh, no, I didn't. All right, so I had to run the application back here in the background so that it's running in a version of IIS Express. And if we uh, take a look at this real quick, a lot of you are familiar with the, the standard rover application that we have that we put together for the Solid Talks. It basically has a little rover here on the map. You can tell it to go forward and send the commands and it'll move forward. You can tell it to turn right and if you click on the map it'll add obstacles in those locations. And then, oh well, yeah, and it turned right. Uh, it's a little hard to tell with the triangle, but basically it has certain requirements to it that, or that we expect, but uh, we need needed to cover that with cucumber tests. So I have that running in the background so that it, I can interact with it here. And if I hit cucumber, um, just a basic cucumber setup will run expectations against that. This is the login screen that that we added just for that. All right, so, but you kind of, if you look at this, it's kind of ugly to look at. There are no colors here. Um, there's a whole, there's a bunch of other things that are missing that that you probably that we're not even aware of yet. Um, so this is a basic implementation of Cucumber. It's you know our spec in Cucumber and the Water Web Driver, and you could install this and run it. But there's, you can go beyond this, and that's um, where we're going to go next. This is hard to do on coding on the screen. <laughs> All right, so you may have noticed that I don't have a Qt's 2 directory here. Um, so. I'm going to install test gen um, bundler um, and let's just get the page object out of the way as well. Now test gen is a gem that was produced by Jeff Morgan. Some of you know him as QC. <coughs> And its sole purpose is to stub out a cucumber project for you, uh, given certain expectations. Um, it assumes you're going to use the page object pattern. It assumes you're going to use RSpec. Uh, obviously, it assumes you're going to use cucumber uh, and rake um, and bundle. So, uh, but the, the nice thing about test gen is that it will it will create all of that for you without you doing anything except what I'm about to do here and that is we basically type in test gen uh, project the project name and then we'll want to give it the page object driver which will be water in our case so give me a second to do that And I am, yeah. And then now we have our QCO2 directory. So, yeah, hold on a second. So here, Uh, it's going to give us this YAML file, which is how we're turning on our colors here. It, the, the stubbed out YAML file just basically has this default. Uh, we're not going to see the source. We're going to add color, and we're formatting it pretty, uh, which I actually don't know what format pretty does. Um, but I know the color will give us color. It's just the ugly. 
<laughs> uh, no, that's all right. <laughs> I don't think there's an ugly option. Uh, we also have our gem file here, which is what Bundler is going to use, where we can stub out uh, the specs. And I do not want to just use our spec um, by itself. I want to use version 2.99. In June, they released both RSpec 2.99 and 3. And 3 had some breaking changes in it that they expected to break certain things. So uh, I want to use 2.99. Um, now, how that would work would be uh, if I do a gem list dash dash local. Um, you can see that we have our spec in here right now. So here's here's another question for the crowd. I want to uninstall our spec here. And I have several gems here that I want to uninstall. Uh, can anyone hazard a guess at how I might do that? Or Matt <laughs> Well, that would do it. <laughs> um, but uh, I think Vince was closer to the mark on that one. So. What's that? Um, yeah, actually, I have 3.0 in there. I don't want that. Um, I just want to uninstall all of these. I have a tendency to put an E in there when I don't want it. And. Uh, those, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that it will. But it, I mean, I could try it. Yeah, I see. I knew I'd do that. I always do that. All right, let's uh, let's give that a shot. Uh, I'll just get rid of this in case. Just try uninstalling that on. Oh, yeah. you. So gem list dash dash local. And now we, we still have that. I think I tried that once before and it didn't work. But fortunately I... Uh, all versions. All right, so now if we do a gem list dash dash local, we can see that our spec is completely gone. The problem is that if I try to do a bundle, so if you're bundler, the command is bundle, and <coughs> Basically, bundle execute will run whatever you're going to run after here in the bundle context. So all I'm trying to do is run Cucumber through bundler. If I do that, you can't see this real well, but it it's saying it's not finding our spec in this case. But it also tells us how to solve the problem. All I have to do is say bundle install, and it will go out there and grab the gem the gems that I need and pull them down. So that's one of the nice features of bundling as a gem. But this is not a required gem. That's kind of why I have it over there on the right. Um, it's just a nice gem to have if you're going to uh, be using uh, the test gem tool and everything. Bundler, self, bundler? Well, no, bundler will use the gem file to drive what the requirements are for your uh, cube setup. Oh, yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> All right, so there's no, there are no features in, in here, though, because we just stuffed this project out. So, uh, But I can go into some of the files. Oh, hold on a second. Yeah, um, so I explained the YAML file, the gem gem file. The rake file is uh, for rake, it's scripting uh, gem associated with that, uh, mainly used for CI builds, at, at least that I've seen. 
Um, we have our standard step definitions folder, which we looked at before. Here, in here, we have an environments variable, which is going to set up all our requirements. And it's also going to instantiate our page factory, which we'll get, get into in a little bit in Kubeso 3. And then our hooks, which if you've done any kind of testing, the, this should be familiar to you, where we execute something before each test. We do something after each test. In this case, we're opening the browser and closing the browser after each test. And there's another requirements require statement in here. In uh, general practice, though, wouldn't that be a bad idea to open the browser? It'd be slower. It would be slower. And, and you can instantiate the browser outside of the after condition, or the before condition, which when we get to three here, we'll see that. Okay. So in Kubeso 3 here, we're actually going to run uh, some tests. Um, so the same setup. I use TestGen to generate these. But in here, we actually have some feature files that are of a little interest. If I open up this, let's just call that login. Um, these are all the login scripts that test whether or not we've got a bad password, what happens when we enter in a bad username, and all of that uh, kind of stuff. And the reason I added this at login at the top is that's a tag. So down here, we can do bundle tags at login. I think it is case sensitive. Um, what am I missing? Oh, WebSocket. All right. Um, so I was missing another gem there real quick. So I grab that. Now, if I do uh, bundle execute cucumber dash dash tags at login, it will only run the login scripts of, of all those feature files that are in there. If I hadn't added that tag, we would have run through about 35 different scenarios that test the, the whole application. Um, but I didn't want to be up here standing and talking that long, so we're only doing the login scripts for now. Um, so tags are real useful. You'll often see them used uh, to separate out certain function, uh, certain pages and things of that nature. Uh, and when I say page, I'm conceptually I'm thinking of the login page as, as a page. Um, and that, that, that brings me to page object. It's really its sole purpose is to um, create an abstraction of your uh, pages that you can work with in code. Um, and what, what's going on here? Uh, okay, so let's go into So are there any questions at this point? No? OK. All right, let's go into the mission features here associated with this. Um, this is the standard version that we looked at before. We're saying, given that we have a mission page, um, when I get <laughs> the image at the center of the map, then it will be that of the rover. Um, If we open up the step definition associated with that, we can find we'll, we'll be able to find the mission page, which would be this visit mission mission page. The page factory um, that I mentioned before it has two methods on it. It has a visit and it has an on. A visit will instantiate the page object and navigate to it. 
uh, whereas the on method will just simply instantiate the page object. Now, I keep saying page object, and what what is that? For anyone who hasn't seen this before, we're in here in the pages. It's basically a Ruby class that includes the page object, and we have our page URL here. Um, and then it will um, in, instantiate all of these methods will create uh, methods that we can interact with uh, the elements on that page. In this case, there are a lot of buttons and a span that is the title of the page. Um, so when we call one of these button methods and we call it fire mortar, we, we're telling it to find that element on the page by its ID, and the ID is fire mortar, and that, that's that fire mortar button on on the uh, rover application. From there, we'll have this actually creates four different methods on the page object itself that allow us to interact with that button in various ways. We can get the value of the button, we can click the button um, based on what method we call. And it's kind of a neat feature of Ruby that, that it's able to do that. Um, but then we can also define methods on the page object itself that will give us certain functionality that maybe the page object doesn't provide. In this case, uh, this get alert message on button click uh, was we were trying to get the pop-up message that was appearing when you didn't uh, when you tried to add obstacles um, when none had been selected. It was a friendly error message. But we wanted a cube test that would cover that. And this was the first implementation. And then Nick and I uh, uh, paired on this, and Nick kept pushing back on saying, I don't like that, I don't like that. We ended up hitting on a much better solution after a few minutes of, of hammering on that. So um, but here you, I left all three methods in here um, as kind of a demonstration. Uh, also along those lines, we had the need to, when you fire a mortar in the application, if it hits an obstacle, it should destroy that obstacle but not create a crater. Um, but if it doesn't hit an obstacle, then it should create a crater. So we wanted to verify that a crater wasn't created when it hit a, an obstacle. Um, the only way to really verify that is to search the entire map uh, for any type of crater, um, which is what we're what I did here originally. Now the problem with that is there are 2,500 images in that little map, and that was intentional, so they would load slow. Um, this takes about 15 seconds to parse all of those images. Well, then Aaron pushed back on this, and he said, well, can't we just use a selector to select the image by its source tag? And so we sat down and played with that and, and found out that, yes, indeed, that's possible as well. And then we just check whether or not it exists. That exists method that on the bottom, back on the very tail end with a question mark, is checking whether or not we've got an instant, whether or not we have a real object. Back. Uh, So, so if we look at uh, the mission feature column on line 23, this is one I, I wanted to discuss transformations also. It's something else we can do here. We have, uh, so given the mission page and a click on the map, so, what? I just wondered, um, so you're in the desktop, have you ever used any of um, that I mean, you can get a 30-day trial with that. It's it seems like a very friendly tool. Um, I cert I would certainly recommend that as an IDE for anybody that didn't want to do this from a command line. But I've seen people do this in Vim, and and I I do it in Notepad plus plus just because I I got comfortable with that. But Ruby Mine would be probably the IDE that you'd want to use 
if you know if you if you're doing anything complicated or, or certainly on a project. Um, yeah. Sublime also is really nice, and there's a bunch of plugins for it too. Yeah. Really. Um, so here, basically, what I'm getting at is this step right here. This 10 by 10 by 10 will display an obstacle. They, this is a grid coordinate on that map, and let me bring um, that up one more time. So what this scenario is trying to say is that um, when, if we're on the mission page and I click on the map at 10 by 10, when I click the add button, then it will display an obstacle. So effectively, what this is testing is a single addition to the map. If I click and didn't quite get to 1010 10 and I add it, that it will appear at 1010. 10. And if I click around here enough, I can probably find 1010. 10. Mm -hmm. But that's effectively what that step is is doing right here. But what the reason I'm focusing on this is because I want to show what we've done with transformations. Um, and that's on 142. So down here, if we look at the step, this is what this the step definition for that actually looks like. So we're using two different transformations here. Um, this is that number x number matcher. And then this is just matching the string display an obstacle. So if I open up the transformations associated with this, Right here is the display an obstacle. For display an obstacle, all we do is return rock, which lines up with the PNG file that we're using to display rocks. So what that lets us do is have that that the name of that PNG in one location. If we use a different image file later on or decide we want to change the name to it, we only have to change it in one location within the entire cube build. Um, to go back to that real quick, that's this display an obstacle. So every, every time in my uh, Gherkin statements I, that I use the phrase display an obstacle, it will translate that to the string rock. Now that may not seem that great, but um, it, can, it, it gives us only one location that we ever have to change that. Uh, that gets transformed right here in the, as we come into the step definition. And then here we are looking at the image and asserting that that it includes rock in its name. Um, the other part here, this image location, if we come back over to the transform, is a little trickier. What I'm doing is taking, I'm matching on a number and then an X and then a number. And anytime I see that pattern, I am going to tra transform the X. I'm going to capture the X and the Y of these two numbers. I, I assigned this to be x and this to be y. And then I create a string that has number underscore number, which is what we've assigned as IDs on all those image tags. So we can grab any location on the map by ID. And, and it allows us in the Gherkin to just detail it as then 10 by 10 will display an obstacle. And uh, as a grid coordinate. Yeah. Has what's that going to do with this, like the IDs in there? No, the IDs are strings. They do begin with that. Okay. Yeah, this is a demo app. So <laughs> and you, you don't see a lot of business apps that have 2,500 images on them. But uh, first character numbers and the these things, it's the component of the Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, th this was just the, the 2,500 images was simply to demonstrate that you can have large collections of images. And if you're doing just basic cucumber scripting, which we didn't have enough time to go into, 
when you went from the login screen to that map page, it would take about seven seconds for it to load. With with base, basic Cucumber, you would have to put a sleep statement in there or something. Otherwise, Cucumber is going to go ahead and try to execute the very next step um, and, and fail because it can't find the page. Uh, with the page object, it, it, it will wait until the page loads before it tries to execute the next step. It's, it's a nice feature. Uh, of That's also part of the reason we did that. But we needed a good way to name them. And um, I suppose we could have prefaced it with uh, MI for map image or something like that. Um, yeah, we pro we programmatically assign those IDs, so that would be a 10-second fix, but I'm not going to do it right now. <laughs> um, all right, so, uh, so it transforms this to a meaningful ID that we can use. And if we run these, um, <coughs> so on this feature file, our, I have a tag at the top called mission control. And if I, no, uh, not, not that. This, will, this won't uh, run any of the login scripts. This will just run the, uh, the mission control scripts and everything. But we'll see how, how it'll come up over here. I'm going to kind of put this front and center. We can see the transformations happening here. They, they're always shown in a lighter green. So we know that a transformation is occurring there. But the, the Durkin steps themselves read like English, and you don't have to be passing strings and doing conversions on things, which you often see uh, in some in some in implementations. So transformations can be really useful for things that are very common. Uh, anything that you can identify that you may need to do more than once is a good candidate for a transformation, in my opinion. So anytime we need to display a crater, we can instead transform that to just give us what the criteria is that we're going to verify that it's displaying a crater. Fine. Um, and let's see. I think that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to talk about today. Um, were there any questions? Um, when is it like an integration test or on build? Or it's on a, usually on a, a CI build. You can run them locally, though. You okay. could set up this on your local uh, desktop and run them privately there if you're on a particular project that would that is not allowing you to run Cucumber tests. But traditionally, you would see this added to a CI build process where every time somebody, well, not necessarily every time somebody checked in because as you get more and more scenarios, the, the run times for your cube uh, builds will, will stretch out to 20, 30, 40 minutes. But you usually run them on a schedule on the CI build, like every hour, um, and on particularly large uh, um, sets, you might you might run it only a couple of times a day. But it gives you verification that any changes that are occurring in the code base aren't breaking existing functionality. Good question. Um, and Vince? Um, when you finish the field for you know, this getting started, how much effort that is, then creating kind of a first pass of a suite of tests that we like to have here. And then third, kind of what it feels like to maintain it over time because we know how to change code, the great test with the well, that, and that's part of the advantage of the page object pattern at all, and the, the good design that, uh, uh, actually, I do have one last thing. Um, so a lot of this is coming from Jeff Morgan's book, Cucumbers and Cheese. Highly recommend this book. It's kind of my Bible. <laughs> um, but... Back to your question, I wanted to make sure I drew attention to that. It's like $14 or $15, and uh, I can't praise it enough. 
Um, that will take you through everything we've gone through here today and and more digs a little deeper and stuff. But as far as maintaining um, Q, uh, your cubes and everything, I think that you'll find they'll actually save you time in the long run. I mean, you will have a uh, cucumber test go red from, from time to time, but when that happens, that's a bug that you would have introduced into production and that you didn't know about. And because you had these cucumber tests that were covering the functionality, and I, and the aha moment is, uh, for me at least, and for a lot of other people I've talked about, is when I'm making a change in, in the code base in one location, and I have a cucumber test that goes red on something that seems totally unrelated, and I, don't, I, I think, I couldn't have possibly have broken that. Um, but I did. I, I changed something that broke an expectation, a, a, a requirement. So <clears throat> if you have a good cube design, you can often look at that and relatively quickly discern, all right, did the requirement change or did I break the requirement? There's one of two situations that have occurred there. If the requirement changed, then I just need to change the cucumber test that's covering that requirement. Um, but if I've actually broken a requirement, then I need to go back to what the changes that I made and, and verify that, that I am not breaking that requirement any longer. Does that make sense, or? Yeah. Okay. Well, what kind of getting at is, again, you're effectively maintaining two code bases there. So. Well, and what I'm getting at is, is I, I would, I would say that the, these will save you time instead of costing you time. I know it seems like you're maintaining two code bases, like you say, but the cost of replacing and or fixing a, a bug in production or somewhere down the line has been shown to be exponentially more expensive. And so catching it early in the process is always better. Um, I, I don't think that maintaining the, the cutes uh, is necessarily uh, laborious. I mean, it, it, I, I suppose I've never really had a good window on, on what it, you know, I've never been on a project where we had cucumber tests and then at some point we said, well, you know, we're not going to do cucumber testing for a little while and see how much more productive we are. Um, I, I just haven't been in that environment. So it's hard for me to tell you what the cost is. I, I can tell you from personal experience that I think this is better because you catch bugs early in, earlier in the process um, or potential bugs. Um, and it's not real hard to maintain if it's done if it's done correctly. Your step definition should be lean. I mean, you should be able to. I know it, it may seem a little daunting to look at these right here, but there, we're talking two lines of code roughly for each step definition. They should be small and concise and do one thing, you know, so that they can be reused in other Gherkin statements. And and this is just, this is my attempt at it. It probably can be done better than this. Um, but it, they end up being fairly clean and concise. And if I, am, if I click on the map at 1010, and I, and let's say at some point, uh, I click on the map somewhere else, but at at 1010 location, I um, let's say I change the functionality to where when you click on the map, it no longer creates a uh, a, 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 um, a crater. Yeah, wait, but this is displaying the ground. Uh, let's go with this step up here. So let's say I fire the mortar and I've changed the range of the mortar um, in my code. The, this test will fail because now the location that I'm specifying in the Gherkin is wrong. Um, so if I come over, uh, I'm kind of doing this on the fly, so bear with me. Um, but let's find this uh, this step right here. This display a, will display a crater. Uh -huh. 
Okay. So on this, we actually had this something similar to this happen. So given the mission page, when I fire a missile, then 2530 will display a crater. This 2530 is five spaces north of where the rover starts. Um, and it will create a crater there because the range of, of a missile is five. Now, if, there, if I change the range of a missile to be 10, then the crater will actually be created at 20 by, uh, or no, 25 by 35 because the numbers go up on the y axis. Um, but when this test goes red, I should be able to look at that and realize I changed the range of the missile. So what's the new value that I need to assign? And I, I don't, the only place I need to change is this right here. And I need to change this 0 to a 5, and that test will be green again. Um, it's, if it's done right, it's, very, it's a very quick change. And I was working with the code that caused it to go red, so it should be very apparent why it's red. Um, does, does that help at all? Um, but, so it's really about how well you design the transformation to centralize like, your change, like aiming at one place and let it go forward. Yeah. So, so the so, same principles of having good maintainable code apply to your test. Yes. So, it is two code bases, but it saves you time in the long run. Nothing has to do with uh, how little the test the tests are, as well as the tooling around the test. Uh, there's some, you know, pricing and something that appears to be that it's not bad, almost little example. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, I, I mean, it's, there is, an, just like with development, there is an art to it as well. And, um, you know, when, when you first get started with it, or even, I've, I've been doing it for a while, and I'm still, I'll, I'll never be an expert at it. Um, there's an art to getting better and better at, at designing it to where um, you have good, short, concise step definitions that, uh, and I, I, I would say of all the things, that's what I would shoot for the most, is always trying to make sure your step definitions are one or two lines of code. Um, and that will will keep your that alone would keep your code fairly clean. I I, I believe. You could also probably argue if those are really small and development maintenance of the tests is more maintenance of feature safety than anything. It's just how yeah. you compose largely, yeah. I mean Uh, to, to a large extent, and I think the page object helps with some of the common functionality there, too. It, it provides that where, like, this on-mission page right here will instantiate th this class right here. And if I want to click on, say, the Add Obstacles button, all I need to do is say on-mission page dot add obstacles, and that will click on that button. Um, and that functionality is encapsulated. It's been vetted by the community. The uh, people have used the page object extensively. You can kind of rely on it. And you don't. If I had to hand code that or roll my own solution, there's a chance that I would have. I'd have a, a large method that's just not well designed and um, might cause me problems down the road. Um, so I think leveraging things like the page object uh, and transformations and, and elements of Cucumber as well are essential to, to coming up with good tests um, that are easier to maintain. Um, I can't remember. Did we, ha did we have a situation where the cubes broke during our... Only the example we gave where we changed the missile to the range of 10 to 5. I think it was fairly easy to, to fix, though. I, I, I mean, I think it was a 15-second fix at most. Actually, in that case, we knew we were changing the functionality of the test, so we changed the functionality and then ran the test and let that run up our code. Yeah, and the, the, 
yeah, the, the, the uh, tags can get real essential in that regard because if you're working locally, you may have this on a CI build, but it's also part of your uh, source control quite frequently. So every developer on the team and every QA person on the team has a copy. You can run them locally. You may not want to run the entire cube suite locally, but if I know I'm working on the mission page, then I'm almost surely going to run the cubes with the mission control tag. Or if I know specifically what I'm doing, I can assign a tag at a scenario level and just run that one scenario again and again to see if, it, uh, if it's red or green. How does this work with like cross-browser testing? You have to run all your tests in Firefox. And all your tests in yeah, usually your CI process would do that, um, but you uh, you would you do that in in the environments variable right here. Um, all right, uh, yeah, Let's see. And then so the page object represents the current. Oh, actually, it's in hooks. Sorry. Um, uh, go ahead. I'm listening. The page object represents the current browser. Yeah, so like right here, we're up, we're past, and when we did the first script, we passed in this Firefox symbol. There's also a Chrome symbol and, and an IE symbol, and those, like in this case, here's, I, I put it on the second line, and um, this Chrome symbol, you have to have this extra switch to get around the security um, warning that it gives you. Um, but effectively, this Chrome symbol would bring it up in Chrome um, instead of Firefox. And uh, there are some things that you don't verify with Qs, like a certain look, and um, you know, there, there's certain. Uh, you don't check for padding like random buttons. No, no, you don't check for things like that. You check for functionality and requirements. Um, it, it's it's your 80% rule. You try to cover 80%. The other 20% has to still be done manually to some extent. But that's the look and feel of things that are real subjective and really best interpreted by a human anyways. You know, if you try to automate that, then you, you might end up with a brittle test suite because the look and feel of things changes daily or can. You know. I've been on uh project where we still had those manual tests in Gherkin, so you can still see all the requirements right now. They were just tagged like manuals. Those got skipped on the run. There was not actual yeah. code, but you could still see, hey, here's the requirements I'm expect, but someone's going to have to go in and check them. Yeah, I've seen the uh, similar thing with uh, work in progress. If, some, if the QA department um, is working on features, uh, scenarios, but they don't want them to be run in the build, they'll often add, add like an at WIP. Um, and then in the CI build, it, you can tell it to ignore certain tags as well. You can say run these tags, but don't run these tags. Um, so I'm not sure I want to type out that statement because it's it's bundle, execute, cucumber, dash dash tags, this tag, dash dash tags, a tilde, not this tag, <laughs> and so on and so forth for each tag. But when it's in a CI script, it's not that big of a deal. So can I answer any other questions? Yeah. Uh, who's the
you're lucky in these situations because you're developing the website at the same time you're writing the chat. So you're like, oh, we know the ID goes to I'm digging it from the beginning, right? But what's a, a person writing queues supposed to do that's going to script in a QA environment where they're naturally most likely not coded? Are they going to look at your source code and say, oh, obviously this is a chat? Well, you do have a lot of collaboration on teams between QA and developers in an ATV environment. It, I'm not going to teach you how to write Ruby. I have seen QA people use the page object pattern to write step definitions and only turn to the development step when they needed to add something to a page object. And I've seen them cover. What's that? Yeah, we But not yet. Exception rather than rule. Well, it, I mean, it. It takes some time, but it's the QA role is getting more and more into a, a development type of, or a, not heavy development, but this type of thing is becoming more and more common. And I think you might be surprised at how many uh, QA professionals out there can take to this very quickly. I've also seen what just the QA will write just the Gherkin, and then developers will yeah. take the Gherkin and write all the regexes out of that. The actual code. So it's like, hey, here are the requirements that I want. It needs right. to read language now, code behind it. I mean, it's not the duty, it's the concept, it's the, the regex. So it's very different. Well, the right. regex <laughs> statements on the step definitions are okay. So let me. Uh, right, so you're going to key out the step definitions while they write the test? Uh, no, I don't have to. They, uh, so the Remember, the definition of script is a given set of instructions. So Exactly what you wrote there, that's exactly what they're doing. It's not. Well, we like this normal for automation, but it needs to be time effective. All right. So, <laughs> so I'm adding this. Especially, I mean, I'm adding this thing. I'm adding this complex set where user logs in. Okay, I'm going to take the complex. Now I'm going to log in. But there's going to be scenarios that you want to test up given. Reset a create a new bank account. Make it a login. All right, so I created. <laughs> Somebody throw a bucket of water on. <laughs> All right, so I created. I added a statement to Gherkin that uh, said, "And Booth gives me a hard time." So I can copy that. Come over here to the step definitions, and anywhere in this file, I can paste that. And instead of just well, appending. I'm going to put, put, um, oh well. So I'll run that test again and we'll see that it'll put. I still have a passing test, but I did also put. A statement to the screen and everything. That puts is basically a print statement. Um, but um, I, I know what you're saying about regex, and I'm not a regex fan, but I can tell you that this is a little different in the sense that Cucumber is a public gem that's used by tens of thousands of development groups all over the world. and if there was a problem with this regex, par regex parsing, I, I, I'm sure there would have been pushback from the community on that. It's all about having the right workflow. Yeah. Show 
Well, I'm just saying there's like a handful of them. There's ones that are more stable, but probably the best are like different tests that you can create and get data action. So this is probably a terrible idea. That's like one of the newer product front end test testing that they recommend. That's what Google recommends for Angular tests. So let's see here. Let me find it. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to use Joel's suggestion. Um, all right. So using Joel's suggestion, um, I'm going to add an MI to the beginning of every ID tag on that. And I, don't, I don't know that this is going to work. So um, we'll and we'll end on this. But now every map um, or every element on that map, if I I'm operating in such a small space here. Um, if I look at them now, the tag is mi twenty six by thirty two, right? If I run my cube tests right now, a whole bunch of them will fail. I, I guarantee you because a lot of them expect to find that. Um, you expect to find map locations based on a number X number format. So if I'm running these, you can't see the red real well back here, but you can see that they're failing. They're just failing all over the place. So the page still works. Um, Yes, the tests are broke. I'm about to fix them. But I made a code change. And they're still not working. Oh, it's because I haven't written. Wait a minute. So I wasn't sure that that would work. Oh, maybe. Yeah, it because I can't just rename. I can't just rename the uh, IDs because it in the code we parse them and and that's. So we would have to. I'd have to cut out the MI portion back here and, and all that. So the code the code doesn't work. So. It's a good example of to do small changes. Do a test and then work on one thing at a time rather than do a bunch of code changes and then I get a bunch of tests failed. What happens is give you the insight. Yeah, con conceptually, I thought I could make a small change like that and not break the code and then just fix the test. But I actually broke the code. Yeah. Okay. All right.